Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. And uh, we'll give it a few minutes for people to join. Uh, it's wonderful to see you guys here. It's great to see people uh, strolling in, see that number increase. Uh, how are you this morning, Wim? Yeah, hi, Eric. All good. Yeah, from Amsterdam, so um, glad to be here. I'm really looking forward to this uh, to this webinar. Very cool. Yeah, us as well. I think we'll have people all over the world, I guess, um, dialing in. So um, yeah, at least uh, Peter and I are from uh, from the Netherlands, based from here. Uh, we'll be joining actually Autocon for people that are also interested to meet us over there. So we're going to go to Denver. Um, so yeah, if anybody's going. Just say hi. I'll be there. Peter will be there. I look forward to meeting anybody there. Yeah, I like how you slide in that pitch for Autocon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, Network to Code as well. We'll have a booth. We'll have a big uh, presence. Uh, we'll have two workshops planned for day two on the workshop. If you're you know there for the workshop and on the day of the presentation, I believe we'll have at least one presentation for customers case studies. So I see, awesome. you know, we actually have a good number of people, uh, but we'll give it one more minute and maybe start in uh, pretty soon. So hold tight and, uh, you know, we'll start pretty soon. All right. Yeah, why don't we, why don't we just get started? Uh, if you if you guys don't mind, because uh, I think we have a lot to to go over today, and I'm very excited for the demo for the content. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So let's get started. Hi everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you are, welcome to our webinar today on mastering network device onboarding, simplifying device discovery, and enriched data collection with Nautabot and Slurpit. Next slide, please. This is our agenda for the next hour. We'll introduce the presenter for the, for the day, of course, and we'll talk about the importance of network source of truth, as well as the importance of device onboarding. After that, we'll discuss how we could discover the devices, as well as we, how we can automatically collect data from them, including a demo session from our friends at Slurpit. One note uh, that I, want, I do want to mention is for Q&A, the chat function is disabled for this session. So please use the Q&A uh, box and features from Zoom to type in your questions and we'll have some time at the end to uh, answer those questions. Uh, of course, toward the end, we will provide additional links for resources, uh, where to go from there if you're so interested. And we do, we do hope you are and you know, try it out. Next slide, please. Again, my name is Eric Cho, Network Automation Advocate from Network to Code. I am joined today by my colleague, Team Shryak, Director of Sales Engineering, as well as Wim Garrett and Peter Van Oss, uh, both co-founders of Slurpit, and Wim also hosts the title of CEO of Slurpit. Next slide, please. We are Network to Code, the network automation company. The company was founded in 2014 by Jason Edelman. We recently celebrated our 10 year anniversary. Uh, we are the creator and maintainer of this open source project called Nautobot, in case you're not aware. And we do aim to build software and services to make network automation a reality. And we handle more network automation projects than any other providers in the world. And I could say that confidently. Next slide, please. And with that, I will hand the mic to Tim to talk about the importance of network source of truth and the importance of onboarding devices. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, so let's dive into this overview here of what we talk about or what we mean when we say understanding a source of truth and what is it. A, a source of truth is really all about a place that we express our intent. What do we want the world to look like? What is actually our authoritative state for the network? Um, and this is really a very different way of thinking about things, particularly for network engineers, where traditionally as network engineers, we think of the authoritative state of the network. We think I should go look at the network itself. Um, but sometimes and quite often, and in fact, 
pretty much all the time in the real world, that's not really the full story. Uh, usually, the network itself does not actually represent its intended state. And that's just the nature of reality when we operate networks. That is, typically, the design isn't fully implemented into the network. And so therefore, actually, when we think of our design and our intended state, it should actually be external to the network, not the network itself. So what is a network source of truth? Uh, it's a place where we can actually define that intended state, where we can express what it should look like and give us a single pane of glass or one place to go and look and see what is it that we'd say our network should be. Uh, it's a place where we can enable our data validation and enrichment. Uh, it gives us an authoritative reference point to look at for our design. And it allows us to then create this delta between what is our intended state versus what is the actual state of the network. And what we have done with Nautabot is to create a tool that actually provides and implements these concepts. Uh, it gives us a place to have a clearinghouse for data, normalizing, enriching that data as we ingest it, and then distributing it back out to our various systems that we might have in our world, whether that's a CMDB or a tool like ACI or a DSIM tool. Uh, we're able to use Nautabot to synchronize, harmonize, and bring all of that data into one consistent interface. Uh, Notabot also gives us a place to access data programmatically, whether it's from its REST API or its GraphQL endpoints. Uh, so what do we mean when we say this intended state? Uh, generally speaking, what we're looking at here is really what are all of the things that inform what the network must be? Uh, so that could refer to our, just our network policies, our rules and configurations that you know, govern the way that we operate the network itself. But we've also going to have other things like our telemetry and monitoring policies, our, our quality assurance requirements, security policy, our compliance standards. You know, Do we have to comply with PCI or, or HIPAA or some other compliance requirement? What are our design standards that we want in our world? Um, and then the performance requirements. You know, We need to meet the, the needs of the application. And then, of course, the business as well, right? Ultimately, the network serves the purpose of the business. Uh, and so as we think about these concepts, these are all of the things that are informing our intended state. Uh, and this is what we're really trying to help through a tool like Nautabon, is give us a place that we can actually define that intended state and meet these requirements. So let's think a little bit about network configuration, uh, and specifically the data that goes into it. So here's an example of a snippet of config from a device. Um, and as we look at it, you know, we're looking at the CLI of the device here, and you say, is that the right configuration? Well, maybe you know off the top of your head, but for most of us looking at it, we really don't know. Uh, so let's break it down into its components. Uh, first, as we start thinking about what we've highlighted here in orange is the actual uh, data on that device. So all of the things that are vendor neutral, if you will, the bits of information that are not relevant, relevant to the syntax of the vendor, but are more about expression of our architectural design and intent. Then we have our network design that is actually driving that data, right? That's the bit that we really care about here in this case, which is what's the design and therefore how does that result in some data? Uh, as, as we think about this, usually this doesn't change that much. Uh, we're probably not changing this that often as far as the design goes, right? But we are changing is the data, those bits highlighted there in orange. So if we start to think about these adding in this expression here, now let's, let's think about how we can take that design uh, and then lay that on top of the data. So designs drive configuration and not the other way around. And that's a key thing to remember here as we think about this, right? Is all about this data points and how do we then use that to conform our design to create our intended state here in our network source of truth. So now let's take a, a little bit of a practical example here, imagining a, a real world example. Uh, let's say we have to do some operating system upgrades. Uh, and you know, as, as we do this in our world, often we're doing this on hundreds or even thousands of devices. Um, it's a really time consuming manual process. Uh, quite often, it ends up taking months of time out of our schedule, uh, which means that we often end up don't do it. We do not do it that often as a result. Uh, typically, we end up trying to do just a few at a time, or we do the ones that we have to, uh, or we do it when security comes and says there's been a, a, a vulnerability that we absolutely must address. We have to stop everything we're doing. We put projects on hold and we focus on this problem. But th there must be a better way. Right? And with automation, there is. 
Uh, so here, what we're looking at is an example of how we can take this uh, manual effort going into, say, to being able to just handle uh, 20 devices, as an example, and it's taking us, you know, 13.7 uh, hours, versus when we start to use automation, we can get this down to, like, one, one hour, approximately. Uh, so now we're, we're much faster on our timelines. We can actually achieve these goals of, say, doing uh, biannual or quarterly upgrades to our devices because we're no longer having to do it by hand. It's no longer something we have to stop everything we're doing in order to achieve this goal. We're now able to move forward, maintain good hygiene on our network because we're relying on automation to do these tasks for us. And highlighting here too, you know, hey, we're able to do our pre and post upgrade tasks consistently, reliably, the same way every single time. You know, I know when I was working as an engineer and, and doing these kinds of things, you often get into the mode where you start to skip steps because you're just rushed, you're trying to get it done. And inevitably, at some point, that comes back to bite you because you forgot to do a test or you skipped doing it because it always works, except for that one time when it doesn't and it causes a problem. So this is a great thing that we can use in the automation heat. It helps us do this busy work, gets these tedious things done, helps us be consistent and reliable and drive better operations in our network. Taking a look at this journey, what does this mean? Uh, we're starting off with this idea of, you know, we have this network documentation. Uh, we have uh, the, our data models. We, we then move into how do we validate that data, um, driving network automation, and then finally arriving at intent-based networking. So we can kind of think of this as this journey. As we, as we go down this path, where do we start? We start with trying to get a handle on good, clean data in our environment. Uh, we do that by making sure our data models and our database match what we have in the real world. Um, and then we start moving into getting our data cleaned up. Pretty much every client that we ever work with, there are sources of data, our, our sources of truth are never accurate to start. So we need to get those accurate and clean, and then we can start to drive automation and finally moving into that final state. Right? So it is absolutely going to be a journey. Um, and as you see down below there, hey, here's some examples of the outcomes that come from it. Because one of the things that we want to show to the business is that, hey, we're getting value back at every step of the way. Um, it's not to waiting till the end to get value to the business. We do see that straight away as we move through this process, right? So we can see value even as we begin. Uh, not about uniquely positioned as a network source of truth and automation platform. Uh, it serves both of these purposes. At its core, we have the source of truth. Um, but we also have a layer on which top on top of which we can drive automation from. And that's a key element of Notabot itself, which is this. Uh, what we see as we have our CMDB, our IPAM, our decent tools, uh, we never keep them up to date because we treat them as documentation. And it's simply something that we just don't have time to ever get to as network engineers, right? Documentation is probably the last thing we ever do. Uh, and so therefore, our sources of truth are generally out of sync with reality. What Notabot enables us because of its automation platform is to start to think of that data as the way that we drive change. And so now we actually use the data to do real work instead of leaving it to the end. Uh, this means that documentation now happens as part of our process rather than something that we have to circle back to at the end to do later. So a key element of Notabot and its philosophy or our philosophy here at Network to Code is how we use data to drive change and not thinking of data as documentation. Uh, so some of the benefits that we see here from Notabot's intent-based approach, uh, we can centralize and harmonize data in the environment. Uh, we can facilitate our workflow automation. Uh, we can streamline our data management process and our automation development. Uh, another key idea is this. Uh, as we create automation in our environment, inevitably, we reach a scale where it starts to become an enterprise uh, critical tool. Uh, and you need to have things like RBAC controls. Uh, we need to have logging. Uh, we need to make sure that it is meeting all of our compliance and security requirements as we start to build out these tools. Not about gives us a framework in which we can develop and deploy this kind of automation while meeting these enterprise grade requirements. Um, another key element of the Notabot ecosystem, really facilitating this process of making a uh, network source of truth and network automation specifically practical and are, are possible in the real world. Okay. So that was our my talk through here on the network source of truth side. And I'm now going to pass back over to the Slurpic folks to carry on. Well, yeah. Well, actually, I'm going to step in quickly. And uh, thank you, Tim, for that wonderful insight for network source of truth. And we're going to talk about device 
discovery and collecting data uh, from the devices. Next slide, please. Many of you have joined us maybe a week and a half ago on the newly released device onboarding app version 4.0 with Jeff, Kayla, and myself. Essentially, we consolidated two apps from previously, the old device onboarding app and network importer app. And we also added features and got rid of some technical debt. So essentially for device onboarding 4.0, it is a two-step process. The first step is, uh, or the first job called sync device from network is to have some of the very basic connectivity information from the administrator for the devices and will automatically gather some of the basic info from the devices and create them in Nautabas uh, database, the CMDB database. And the second uh, step, sync data from network job is to collect more detailed attributes such as your interface IDs, IPs, VLANs, verbs, et cetera, and um, to, to enrich those uh, device information. And the job is also idempotent, so we can safely run the jobs continuously and interactively. Next slide, please. Also, for our device onboarding app, we do require IP addresses, as you know, you saw from the webinars before, and we also had the demos back in that webinar from uh, several days ago. We do require the IP addresses as, as inputs and some of the basic information, such as your login credentials, uh, these credentials could be uh, configured through the UI and the IP address could be imported from CSV, but we do need to, to know them in order for the two jobs to run and collect data. And we see this solution as best use when the devices on the network are known uh, and just those devices haven't been populated to Nautabot yet. We understand some engineers might prefer more uh, of a crawler auto discovery solution, maybe for you know, uh, road devices discovery on a continuous basis, or perhaps there is a business acquisition situation where you need to crawl and onboard the devices quickly, which uh, brings us to our partner Slurpit for their solution. Awesome, thanks a lot, Eric. So uh, I'll take over for a few slides here and then actually hand it over to Peter af afterwards to actually show it. But uh, yeah, let me explain why actually we started Slurpit. I was always good to solve a problem, right? And the problem that we saw in the market is when people want to start, engineers want to start with network automation, like how do you start filling the, the source of truth? Like how do you discover all your relevant information and onboard this into a, a source of truth? So that's really what we tried to do. And we wanted to use as many open source um, uh, technology uh, possible. So we chose for text FSM as a way to parse. And the beauty of this was is uh, Network Decode obviously had a already a huge library uh, of text FSM templates. Uh, I think when we started, it was about five or 600. At the moment, we're at 1,000 text FSM templates that already have been made. So you don't need to write them to parse all the common commands from all the uh, common vendors. So we use NetMiku under the hood. So about 117 vendors are supported. And we built like an enterprise application around it that is really um, yeah, able to, to scale this up. So you can scale the application. It, 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 it allows you to have a unified uh, a, API. Uh, and lastly, uh, it has a free version that makes it possible for anybody to use. So the free version allows you to do unlimited device discovery. Even if you don't know any IP address, you just give it a range. Or like Eric was saying, we have a crawler. It can crawl through the network and find devices. Once we have it, you run the show commands and parse the data. So we have TextFSM. We actually develop new vendors for Kirk Pyre, his project, or create TextFSM templates if customers don't know to you how to do it themselves. And we offer the free plugin for the for the Nautobot plugin. Okay, next slide, please. So um, I think we already said this. So three things that that Slurper does: discovery of unknown or known devices, and then discover all the data and bring it into your Nautobot. So, and I think it on the right, uh, Eric was talking about, I think Tim was talking about this journey. We see the same thing. You need your inventory. On top of that, you need to be uh, able to, to do the config management and compliance, but in the end, you want to onboard all that information in your intended state. Next slide, please. So Peter is going to show this actually, the two ways to, to do the first step, like the discovery of the uh, devices. 
there was a way to start giving like SNMP and using the a range subnet ranges. And there's a crawler way where if you don't, maybe you don't know your network, it doesn't have a management domain, give it an IP address and it starts crawling and figuring out which one of the IP addresses that it finds are actually network devices. And then the next slide, it can actually um, go in once we have the, the devices, uh, go in and run all these text devices and templates and you can scale this up. So it's very flexible. You can define your own plannings, which data you want, how often, and, and yeah, bring it into your Nodabot. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Peter uh, to, um, to show it. Hi, everybody. And welcome to the, yeah, to the demo, actually. Um, before I start showing the product and before I show how everything is set up and how things work, I always like to uh, map out the architecture a little bit before we start. Um, so when we start creating Slurp a bit more than a year ago, uh, we were like, okay, we don't want an application which only runs like on a single operating system or something. Let's let's make it multi-service. Let's start creating containers. Let's hook the containers together so that it becomes kind of like an infrastructure, which is very easily scalable, upgradable, uh, and so on. So this is a little bit how the architecture looks like. So there is a portal at the top, and the portal is the GUI and the API. And the cool thing about this is you can run this on-premise or, for example, in the cloud. So it can, can be like partially a SaaS application. And then at the bottom, we have a data warehouse, which is where all the collected data from the network ends up in. And this is a NoSQL database. And we created two services at the bottom, which is a device finder, which you can configure. It will just go over your network. It will look for devices. And when it finds them, it puts them in a database. And then the data collector will kick in and start actually collecting the data from the devices it found. And the cool thing about this is since it's like a serviced uh, infrastructure, that you can keep the data on site or on premise on your location in your data center, and you could potentially host in the cloud like only the GUI and the API. This way you can segment your data and the usability of the product. But that's not just it. The best thing, what I personally like about having a containerized application is that you can easily do horizontal scaling. And that's what we also did with Slurpit. So if you have multiple security domains or just a very, very large network, which you cannot just thread it or with async scan uh, fast enough. You can do similar like what GitHub and GitLab do. You can configure runners or we call them workers. So you can have different workers separated over the globe, separated over your, con uh, over your company, which will then all do the same, like they will communicate back to the application. So. The more workers, the faster the data collection goes. Um, that's for the architecture. So Slurpit itself. Um, so this is the portal image you see here, the portal container. And what you always start with is like in here, you see like kind of a dashboard where you see like the basic information, like okay, how many devices are found recently, how many templates do I have? Because what's good to know is that we our device finder is like an essential tool to yeah, scan your network and put the devices in here. But what is also possible is that if you have already like a configured Nautobot system, for example, that you install our plugin, we grab the devices from Nautobot, and then we start scraping the data. So the device finder is, is a utility. You don't per se need it, but it's very handy, very useful. The data collector is using what Wim already said. It's using TextFSM. Why did we use TextFSM? Well, Google created a great piece of software there. It's stable, it's still being maintained. And the folks of Network to Code made so many templates that we uh, kind of like work together with them. So we're like, okay, we use your templates, we sync them automatically in our application, and we make something on top of that, that if people will use our product and make a new template, that they can uh, share them back. So the template will arrive at our place, we will test it, we will validate it, and we will then eventually commit it back to network to code So this is kind of how we try to build like a hybrid model around it. Um, so that's a little bit about Slurpit. So now I'm going to start with the basics. The device finder was always it. So what you see here now is that there are a couple devices already in this device table. Of course, it's pretty straightforward. There is an add button. You can import devices by CSV or by using our API or 
the finder. Um, what Eric mentioned before is that they have a finder as well, but they need IPs as an input. And this could be a very handy tool for that because for us, what you can do here, you can specify an IP range, you can specify IP addresses, and based on the SNMP information, version two or version three, we'll scan the network. And if something responds, um, we try to log in with SNMP, and based on the SNMP information we get back, we try to fingerprint what kind of device it is. And by having that data, we know, is it the Cisco IOS? Is it the Nexus? Uh, what product type is it? And so on, the host name, FQDN. And then we have the basic information you also need to actually onboard a device in Adobe. Now, the first big customer where we actually try this out during the POC period, uh, or MVP period, actually, he told me like, okay, we have uh, branches all over the globe, uh, but we don't really have a management subnet because we have it all outsourced and we don't know. So we were there like, okay, this is not going to work. So how do we do that? So we created a crawler. Uh, the idea was that in the finder, you then put your, your core network, which, which you normally know the, I hope at least you know your management range of your core network. And we will find your core routers, you put them in here, and then the data collector kicks in and start grabbing the LLDP, CDP, ARP, like all the related IP addresses from those network devices. Then our crawler, here you can configure from which planning of collected data it can use the IP addresses, kicks in, it tries to find all the IP addresses find from this collected data, and then it's going to try per IP address, are you a network device, are you a network device, are you a network device? If it is one, it's being added to the system, and then it's added to the whole batch of collecting data again. And this way, it's kind of like, as it says, crawler, spider, like it's hopping over the network, trying to find new devices, adding them to the system, and it will be like a moving process until we find everything in your network. So that's it for the device finder. Um, the device oh, sorry, the data collector, that works a bit different. So for the data collector, we created uh, a planning page. Took us a bit of time to figure out a good name because we're like, how do you call something where you specify which and when you want to collect certain data? So I was like, okay, it's a planning. You plan when and what data you want to collect. So in the a planning, you give a name, you say how long you want to keep the data, uh, how often you want to collect the data, and it will just start doing what you configured and get all the data from the network devices in. Now, by default, we, as we call it, the golden 10, like we provided like a blueprint. But uh, yeah, since we use TextFSM under the hood for templates, you can just add your own planning, select the template you want to use, and Slurp it will uh, start crawling that data. So you can, if you want ISAS data or VRF, multicast, I don't know. If it's not in here, you edit yourself and Slurp it will start crawling it. Um, how we do that is you see here for planning, you see operating systems because it's a multi-vendor product. And in a planning, you can then select, uh, you, you can find your operating system. You can select one of the text of them templates, specify the commands you want to use. And here at the bottom, it will be then normalized into like a certain data object. I will not spend too much time on that in here, but Eric will show some, uh, share some links later on where you can get a bit more technical information like how this is set up. Um, so the bound of the base, the foundation of a planning are still the templates. And that's what you see here. So here you see all the templates we support out of the box. And I always like to take an easy one people know, for example, the Cisco. And here we have now the Cisco template in which you can just edit in here as well. So the, the template we synced from network to code are available in here. You can change it, you can build it, you can immediately like validate it, like, hey, is my template actually going to work? Yes or no. Uh, but you can also live test it while building it. So we have a simulation lab on a root, we call Mockit. And um, yeah, while building, I can do a test. Let's see if it works. It works. So I get my ARP table back. It's using TextFSM to parse it. And then it's being stored in the database. Um, that being said, so that's the foundation, the basics of Slurpit. Now there are a couple extra things. So we have, uh, for example, transform rules. 
So if you want to normalize certain data when it comes in, or you like to tweak or fine tune a little bit, you can write your own Jinja template. And based on incoming data, you can manipulate it actually before it's being stored. So you can more and more uh, alter, alter the data the way you want it to be. But the best thing is we can actually integrate it directly into an Autobot. So that's what you see here. You see here it says plugin connectivity is green, which means we have, we have a connection with Nautibot. So when you have set up Nautibot and you installed our plugin, you see here in the menu on the left, slurp it. And the first time you have to set up the plugin. So you can configure like how data should be synchronized. Uh, is Nautibot only pulling the data in or are, are we also from the slurp it side pushing the data toward Nautibot? This could be useful if you have, for example, some kind of cloud-based system where the Nautibot cloud instance is not allowed to access your network on-prem. Um, in this case, you do both. Uh, you can make the connection to slurp it. You can test it quickly, like, hey, is there some kind of connectivity? And when that's all good, uh, yeah, they, they set up a match, a connection. So we can start onboarding and doing stuff with the data. So the first thing, what this webinar is actually about, is onboarding the devices. So what we do is the moment our device finder or crawler finds a device, we use some kind of callback mechanism. So we won't wait until the whole job is finished and then get the devices. Like the moment a device responds, it's being sent to our portal by the warehouse. And then the portal is directly doing a callback to the plugin to edit in here. So when you have a job running, you will see new devices popping in during a batch. Um, in here, you can onboard them. Why is the onboarding part needed? Well, maybe you don't want Slurp it to manage certain devices, uh, but also when you add devices to Nautibot, you maybe want to change certain settings before it's in there. Maybe you want to select which rack it's hanging or other info, which we don't have from the finder. It's like some basic information. So I select one device, I go to onboarding. I can add um, extra optional metadata or parameters. But for now, I'll just uh, select some basic stuff and I click on apply. Now you will see here it's onboarded, which means Slurpit can start maintaining this device. You see two more tabs, migrate and conflict. If uh, Slurpit detects that um, the hardware model has changed or the platform has changed, it could be that you are into a migration. So let's say you may be switched from Juniper to Cisco or the other way around, but you kept the host name the same. That means in Autobot, you want to be aware that the device is being swapped, but you maybe also want to update your device type. Um, so we detect the change, we put it in conflict, and then in conflict, you have the option to update the device where it will just update the, the platform and device type, or you can recreate it where it will delete the old one and set the new one. Uh, the migrate tab is when you have a brownfield Nautobot and you want, um, you start synchronizing with Slurpit, then the first time it will say like, okay, this is how we discovered the data. This is how you already had it in there. What do you want to do? Like who is leading? In this way you can like ignore and just onboard it or not. So that's where the mig migrate tab is for. Now, when a device is onboarded, um, we help you with a couple of things. So if you're, for example, new to Nautobot and you still have to add all the platforms and device types and stuff in there, like we do that for you while onboarding the device. So you see here the platforms, but you see also here like this device we just added. Like that the type is added, we, we set the management IP to it, but we create an extra tab called Slurpit. This is similar to the LLDP neighbor tab, which is already there, which is using the Napalm um, uh, yeah, driver. It's just what it does here is that it sets an API call towards Slurpit to get the data. So this way I can get the latest collected data from interfaces or from R, for example, and this way, yeah, you can you can kind of it's not live data, but it's like recently collected data from Slurpit. Um, we also connect it with the uh, with the Redis caching server. So when you open it once, it will be cached, so it's much quicker and it doesn't overload your database too much. Um, so yeah, this is like a handy feature that you can have like direct insight. Okay, what's in my network from Nautilus? Um, So yeah, that part is all about device onboarding. Then the next step is a uh, reconcile. So start filling the Nautobot data objects because 
here you see the data, but this is not inoutable yet. Like we, we do create a separate table where Slurpit will store those records. So if you have some kind of notable app where you need this kind of data, it's you can reach it, it's in there, but it's not stored in the notable, I call them data objects. That's what we're gonna do now with the, with the recon cell, which will be step two. Uh, but before I show you the recon cell, I show you the tab data mapping because with the recon cell, it's the same. Like currently we support uh, four data objects, IPAM interfaces, prefixes, and VLANs. And it's the same here, like there is certain data which we cannot find from the network, which you maybe like to add while reconciling data. For example, description, maybe everything that comes in should be marked as by Slurpit so that you know, okay, this IPAM or prefix was added by Slurpit. Uh, but you can also disable the reconcile so that all the data we find will be automatically being updated in Notable and that you don't first have to approve or deny like, okay, do I like this incoming change? Um, so that's that's a bit the concept of it. And if I go now to the reconcile page, you actually see already incoming data because I had this planning run before. Um, so what you see now here is you see the IPAM, the prefixes, and that's being taken from the Slurpit collected data. So what I showed before, like we have a planning and the planning relates to collected data. And from this collected data, from those ARP tables or those interface tables, we grab the data we need for reconciling in uh, Notable. So if I go now here, and um, it's a side note, this is good to know. When there is a diff and you click here, the pop-up comes and you can actually see, okay, this is the state in Notable and this is the state that Slurp is sending toward me. So you know a little bit like, okay, do I want to allow this change to happen in Notable, yes or no? But you can also here with the edit button actually change the incoming change. It's a bit double, but you can change the incoming change before you be yeah before you kind of commit it. And if I do this now and I accept it, and I put it all in there, same for the prefixes. And I go here to my item and my prefixes. You see that the data is added. You see here the utilization. So it's yeah, it's being added by us. It's being filled, and those are one of the one of the data objects we support from Slurpit. More will come over time. Uh, this is what's in there right now, and what we can do uh, with Notable. That was it for me. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Women Peter. Well, let's uh, open up some questions. Um, so the first question is, how do you handle multiple network domains? And I think that's uh, for the Slurpit folks to answer. Yeah, so um, with this horizontal uh, scaling uh, architecture I showed you in the beginning, like we can put a worker in a separate domain. So it's not that our crawler needs to have access to all the DMZ zones, for example, like you can put one in every zone. The only thing it needs is connectivity to the warehouse. And this way um, there will never be a direct access from the portal or the API toward uh, one of the workers, which is actually connected to the network. Like the warehouse in the middle is the proxy. And if you separate the services over the network, then uh, yeah, let me secure this somehow and make it possible. Cool. Oh. And I, I like the next question because I think it's mandatory nowadays to have one question regarding AI. So how do we interact with uh, AI? <laughs> well, actually, what we have been doing as a side project uh, for the last five, six months, we have we have like a project where we're trying to have our own offline model, which can create those text of exam templates. So we're doing uh, transfer learning. So we have we have like a script running, which is doing every five minutes to open API a request for one of the 117 vendors we support. Uh, it comes in with a template and an output. We validate that. If it works, we store it in a separate database. And at the moment, I have more than 15,000 uh, valid XFSM templates there with configuration. And we have another text language model, which is running on that already for three months now learning uh, how to create automatically a template from it. And uh, well, I hope 
I hope in two months it's it's mature enough that we can uh, actually start releasing it, that people can automatically generate a text of them template without having to know how that all works. Um, that's for the templating part. The other part is, yeah, interacting with AI. I, I always say, if you want to build some kind of AI model for your network to learn, uh, I don't know, to have like a, a smart engineer who can help you find troubles or improvements in your network, you need data. Uh, so what we are trying to do is like give you all the data in there that you can integrate it with existing models. Like you can take the the one from Facebook or the one from Microsoft who work offline that you can actually have it uh, understand your offline data and then interact with it. Yeah, the conversational piece is always big. And I know for not uh, for network to code, you know, we're also actively working on uh, some of the proof of concepts. And uh, so for us, it's kind of like stay tuned. Um, anything you want to add there, Tim? No, I, I completely agree, Randy. We're seeing a lot of use cases where this technology makes sense for us, and uh, it's something we're actively exploring and looking forward to bringing to the community and to our clients. Cool. Yeah, so, and I also answered this one question, really, uh, I, I didn't know it was aimed at Nautobot or uh, Slurpee specifically, but the question was, is it possible to define device credentials per device type? such as for uh, CREDS for NetScaler, use the CREDS for Checkpoint, or will the device finder try to use the same credential for each network device it finds? Uh, for Nautobot, you know, we have the, the secrets integration, and that's what I uh, put in the, to the answer, but I don't know if you want to answer that for on the Slurpit part, Peter, or when. Yeah, so for the device finder, it's using the SNP credentials, which are normally a bit uniform in a company, uh, because we only need uh, the read access. But then when we start collecting the data, you can configure a vault similar to your secret. And currently you can configure a vault per device type. So it will use for the firewalls a different credentials as for example, for the, for the Cisco iOS devices. And we are changing now to a method where you can also specify credentials per device. But from my experience from any big enterprise companies, they always have some kind of automation user, which is allowed at least to touch certain domains of the network. Uh, so we went for that approach that, yeah, you define yep. a vend, uh, device type and you add the credentials to the, to the type. Yeah, like a role account. Um, so, yeah. and then that's, you know, rotated secret. So you actually lock that down a little bit better versus, you know, like the human intervention. And for, for network automation purposes, you, you do want a role account that's, you know, dedicated for your automation tasks. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, so let me let me move on to the next question. Uh, oh, and uh, I forgot to mention uh, for network to code. I mean, obviously we'll have some links up toward the end. If we don't get to your question, uh, we'll get back to you directly. And um, you know, we also encourage you to enjoy our Slack group where there's you know a ton of uh, NTC folks as well as the community is there to answer the questions if we don't get to it today. But you know, if we don't get to it today, we'll definitely follow up. So the next question is, I am curious about how Slurpit discovers unknown devices. If it's unknown, how does it know what credential to use to connect it to and uh, to that device and to capture data from it? I think that kind of goes back to uh, what you mentioned about you know, SNMP and crawling, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, so we, um, we have our own uh, database where we try to fingerprint the device, right? So we map everything back to, net me, to the net me go way of styling a, a vendor. Uh, so when we see it's a Cisco IOS, we call it Cisco underscore IOS. Sometimes that for the Cisco parts, that's not really easy, but when you go a little bit deeper to other network defenders, sometimes it becomes a bit tricky. So we have, we have some kind of database where we map the logic into the device. If we cannot detect it, we uh, call it generic. So if we could log in, but we could not detect what kind of device this is being called generic. And then there is a special um, table in the tool where it says like, okay, this device, we could not fingerprint. This is the information we find. And then we ask them to share it with us. And then we will add it to the database. But we're working on a way to have the database in the tool itself so that people could also fine tune it themselves. Yeah, I know. I know the question specifically says slurp it, but I'll bring in the device onboarding 4.0 as well. And we do uh, also try to auto detect uh, the device uh, because we only need the um, credentials and 
IP address, right? So we'll go in and we'll try to, uh, you know, guess what the device is. But uh, I would encourage you to go back and watch the, the demo that Jeff did uh, about a week and a half ago for the last webinar. Uh, um, you know, if we, if we could specify a device type, it will speed out the performance, but we do, you know, kind of handle it the same way as before. Um, anything you want to add there, Tim? No, I think that's uh, exactly correct as far as, yeah, how we handle it from the network code side. Sounds good. Uh, so the next question is network devices or host devices, just to understand correctly. And uh, I'll, you know, for us, it's it's a device, but for Slurpit, um, I think uh, it's better answered by either you, Peter, or Wim. So the finder will look for network devices, but the host devices are visible in it. If you, for example, open the ARP uh, planning, then you see like all the IP addresses and we try, we automatically do a lookup so that you see like the registered DNS names and stuff. So you, you can find the host devices. We will just not discover them with SNMP, but you have, you can find them when they, they're scraped from a network device. And just to add, you also do the lookup for the MAC addresses, right? Based on the four, four digits. Uh, so yeah, you have your uh, vendors all in there that we, uh, that we Yeah, we do some the... metadata enrichment. So, so the, the first six digits of a MAC address, we translate automatically to the vendor and an IP, we automatically translate to uh, the DNS name, how it's configured. Um, that, that's in there by default. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. But the OUI sometimes is confusing, right? Because the OUI sometimes the, is the nick that doesn't match to the organization. But, you know, it's a, I think one more signal on how we could uh, tell what the device was. So the next question is, how does Slurpit log in during a sweep discovery, the credentials? I think you showed that, didn't you, uh, Peter? SNP, yeah, using SNP. Yeah, and then from the SNP, then we know what kind of device it is. So then we know how to access it with NetMiko. Yeah. Version um, two and three, right? And yeah. which vault to use and so on. Yeah, yeah SNP, VT, uh, two and three, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I was gonna say, yeah, V3 as well. Cool. Yeah. So the next question is a, a question for Slurpit. If SNMP credentials are used for collections, can you also collect, for example, uh, a vault for this? For example, a customer has 50 locations, every location has one credential, so spread it out. Or can we also use API credentials with a central attack axe radius count for collecting? Does that make Not sense? Yeah. I'm not hundred percent sure I fully understand the question, but uh, so so from the I think it's two questions. So the credential part, I think it's like can we use something like HashiCorp, store the credentials in there, use those credentials to log in on the devices? Am I correct in interpreting yeah, it? The, yeah, I think the idea here is asking about like, hey, could I have uh, looking up in a vault based on location? So, you know, I'm scanning this particular site. I want to use these particular credentials for that site. Um, and then the, the the sub B part of that question was, or could I use TACAX or something like that instead? Yeah. Um, so currently this is not possible. Like the vault is based on the device type with the, with the idea that uh, you have a read only automation user because we don't have to make changes in the network we just need to be able to do show commands uh, but we're now changing the fold a little bit that it becomes a bit more dynamic that you can also assign a specific fold to a specific site or assign a specific fold to a specific device um, so it's not in there yet but yeah it's coming yeah cool yeah thanks for the elaboration tim uh, the next question is, can Slurpit pull in module details, for example, in a Nexus 9506, all the line cars, models, and serials? Um, I'll answer it from the device onboarding 4.0 perspectives. Uh, right now, we, we don't, although the 2.3, we do have models that supports chassis. But uh, right for, you know, at least for device onboarding, you'll just see it as the, uh, the, as the, uh, the chassis and not the individual line car. And I'll pass it on to you, Peter or Wim to answer on the Slurpit pipe. Well, how Wimit always mentions for us is if <laughs> there is a show command for it, we can slurp it. So if you can get those details in the CLI with a show command, then we can uh, store it in Slurpit. Yeah, yeah I, I, li I like this question, just to, just to elaborate on that question. So I think the power of Slurpit is its flexibility, right? So it's like like a, like, like a, a method to actually 
bring in your own data. So as, as if there was any show command, you can create a text FSN template for it. There's 117 vendors. If there's not there, we'll add one, but you can build your own template, your own planning, say how often you want this and bring it into the, all the right tables and normalized column fields, et cetera, and bring that all then back into, into the Nautobot uh, application. So I think that's the power of the flexibility. If you, if out of the 10 standard attributes that Peter showed you in the planning, you can add as many as you want uh, and as, uh, attach as many vendors and, and templates uh, that you can think of show commands. Let Sorry, Tim, you were going to say something. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I say I love that tagline. If there's a show command for it, we can slurp it. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we yeah. always says. <laughs> that, that's that's why why they pay him the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> the mar the mar just the marketing one slide one one sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, so the next question is, can Slurpit take data from centralized neural devices, Nescular AMD, MDS, VCO, or uh, it won't discover those devices? So by centralized devices, I, I suppose it means uh, like chassis-based or, you know, or am I reading it wrong? API-based, I think as well. Uh, it says a centralized neural devices, so. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm pretty. Personally, I'm not too familiar with the Nescaler ADM, MDS, VCO, so... Uh, orchestrators. Maybe... Orchestrators, he means, yeah. Okay. Um, so can Slip take data from it? So maybe pull the API from the centralized and then go discover it, or...? Well, if it has... Yeah, I don't want to repeat it again, but if it has a CLI and you can get it with a show command, then yes, we can already do it because there is the NetMiko uh, Linux driver. And most of the time, those systems like Netscaler and so on, they have like a generic uh, SSH server. So you can actually access it already with the Linux driver. Uh, we're working on API based so that we can also do cloud and so on. But we need to find a way, like what we do with TextFSM, that you can turn a text into something parameterized uh, for, the, for the columns and stuff. So um, yeah. Welcome. Got it. Welcome on a centralized API controller based systems. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And uh, next question, I think this is for when. Uh, what do you get from the pay model? I, I guess the license model for Slurpit. So maybe you want to differentiate yeah. between the free and the pay first. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's also on the website. So people can go there on the pricing. You'll see the free version basically has an unlimited uh, license for device discovery plus the plugin to, to Nautobot. So we don't care if you have 100 devices or 10,000 devices, you can basically run the application and, and find the devices. For the first 10 devices, uh, you can also parse and get the data from all the planning and templates. Uh, if you want more than 10 devices or you want to yeah, basically extend above the 10 devices and getting data in, then you need a license. So I think uh, as a start, I think the first problem that people have you can solve with the free version, find your network devices, uh, normalize, and bring it into, um, yeah, at least have the basic attributes from the devices in your um, in your Nautobot. So that's free. OK, got it. And, and then maybe just to add, we have some enterprise features for the horizontal scaling or some, some advanced single sign-on features. But yeah, the professional license, basically, it's, the, the pricing model is uh, device-based per number of tiers. So up to 200, up to 500, up to 2000. You can see it on the website. And um, in terms of pricing, we, we try to be as, well, I don't, I don't wanna say like the pricing is is competitive. Let's put it like this to too many like of the big players out there. And I think we want to make a point solution that um, is, is, is easy to be used and, and also get the right level of money for to, to use it. So. Uh, yeah, okay. I think we're we're quite cost effective there. Got it. Yeah. So in the interest of time, you know, uh, we may not get to all the questions, but again, you know, we'll follow up afterwards if we don't get to your question. And also, we will encourage you to you know kind of join our Slack channel, and we'll have a, a ton of resources out there, either already answered or you know could be answered by the community or network to code folks. So next question is, how do we ensure that discovery on network devices only include modules, components, and parts? of interest, I guess, if you could limit the scope um, of the, the data collected. Um, and I'm gonna skip the, the, the next part of that question because I think that just kind of goes into the, the, the first part. 
yeah, how do we ensure the discovery of network devices? Say you you find a bunch of information, you just want input this much. Oh yeah, I think you can just limit it to the to the planning. I think Peter can uh, elaborate in detail, but you can define yeah how many attributes you want, uh, how long you want them. You can even define unique um, versus historical data, uh, time wise. So there's a lot of way to to dice and slice and dice the number of input. I think right, Peter. You want to add something to that? Yeah, the plannings are flexible. You can even say that you want certain data only from certain vendors and not from other vendors. Uh, you can uh, can say how often it should run. So you're yeah, you're yourself in control of which data you would like to have, how often, and for which devices. Yeah. Cool. Maybe um, maybe one thing, Peter, to add. You didn't mention like the API, but the whole system is is of course um, full REST API based. So. You can even just retrieve the relevant data, uh, even if there's more data in in the data there's warehouse. There's an SDK. There is an SDK. There is an API. Yeah, you can you can interact with other systems. That's the whole idea. That's why we interacted with Notable as well. We made this plugin. Um, yeah. What what I would like to say, Eric, you talked about Slack. We we have a channel there as well on your Slack actually. So if people have questions, um, you can find us there as well. Yeah, it, it is a public Slack. So you know uh, the. Yeah, I think a couple thousand people um, have already joined. And uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of resources there. And it's a one-stop shop for, you know, the questions and answers. Um, in the interest of time, we'll probably just move on to the next uh, slide. So for uh, you want to go over some of the resources, including the Slack channel and uh, getting started guide for you uh, for Slurpit? Well, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the generic uh, URL is the getting started, as you see in the top. But I think what's really interesting is Peter created a dedicated sandbox environment that contains both a Nautobot instance as well as a Slurpit instance plus the plugin, right? So you can go there. Uh, that's the link. And uh, it refreshes every day. So you can actually just mess around and whatever you do. Um, there is a, a complete... Uh, imitator net, imitation network. I think Peter mentioned it called Mocket underneath. So you can just trial out all kinds of vendors and text template, templates if you wanted to. So that's available on the sandbox. Then there is a whole playlist uh, that we recorded that goes into de detail on how to configure the Nautobot plugin. And it, there's a whole course. It's freely available. It's on YouTube. So uh, just follow that and you can configure the entire thing and goes in, in, in much detail than more detail than Peter did. And same for, so Slur same for Slurpit. We, we left out a lot of technical details because, uh, yeah, it's a collaboration yeah, a webinar, right? There's so, a separate, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a separate um, playlist for Slurpit. You'll find it yeah, once you go to that playlist. Cool. So some of the key takeaways from today are the importance of network social truth for a data-driven approach for network automation, we also talk about the different ways we could do the initial device onboarding and the continuous collection of data from devices, either with device onboarding 4.0 or with our partner Slurpit. Next slide, please. Again, thank you for attending uh, the webinar today. We know your time is valuable. If you're interested in learning more about Notabot, Notabot apps, the documentation, Notabot Cloud, of course, the links are provided on the screen please do reach out to us for a demo on our website as well. And I want to thank you for attending the webinar today and we look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks everybody. Hi guys. Good one.